this the pre or pre class lecture for September 5th, Wednesday. The topic for this class period is to talk about molecular geometry and then get into the nitty gritty details of how carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen form their uh, structures and how they can form different geometries by talking about hybridization and the real uh, real details of how we form uh, covalent bonds in carbon. So we'll start with kind of a review of general chemistry in terms of molecular geometry. When you were back in general chemistry, you did Lewis dot structures. You may have talked about resonance structures, and then you went on to determine the three-dimensional structure of molecules, which is the molecular geometry. And then sort of then next you did in polarity, whether it was polar or nonpolar intermolecular forces and so what we're going to sort of quickly review here is the idea of molecular geometry and just in organic chemistry the three-dimensional structures of the molecules are extremely important and we're going to talk about different types of stereochemistries later on including some that are really really um, quite intricate and, and very subtle but can have a huge difference in the reactivity of organic molecules. And if you go on and study biochemistry, the shapes of biomolecules is very important because that can oftentimes lead to one reaction or another reaction depending upon their shape. So how do we determine shapes? Well, first we need a valid Lewis dot structure. And then we need a central atom. And once we have that central atom, we then look at the number of valence electrons that surround the central atom. And again, what are the valence electrons? The valence electrons are the outermost electrons, and those are the ones that are in the lone pairs and the bonding pairs. So the valence electrons are basically the electrons that are used in the Lewis dot structures. And the theory that we use to predict molecular geometry is called valence shell electron pair repulsion theory or the Vesper theory um, and in this case what we're going to do is take our Lewis dot structure and convert it into a three-dimensional geometry by by basically determining the number of lone pairs and bonding pairs and then that will fit into basically the core of one of, of a number of geometries. So when we draw a Lewis dot structure for an atom, uh, for an atom, uh, and we choose a central atom, we're going to treat the lone pairs, the bonding pairs, and the lone pairs as if they were big clouds of electron density. And so, for instance, if I had water as my starting structure, I would look at the oxygen, and I'm going to calculate. I'm going to count up how many lone pairs and bonding pairs are around that water, which in this case is four. And then I'm going to take that number of the total number of bonding and electron pairs or, and lone pairs, and I'm going to put it into one of five geometries. It's either going to fit into when we have two clouds of electron density around the central atom, or we have three, or we have four, or five or six clouds of electron density. And since we're treating these bonding and lone pairs of electrons as if they're big clouds of electron density, these balloon models work fairly well. Remember that the like charges repel each other. So the basics of Vesper theory is if you put two clouds of electron density around a central atom, they're going to get as they're going to try and get as far away from each other as possible. And so in this case, it's going to lead to them being 180 degrees away from each other. If we put three lone pairs, they will adopt a geometry where the three clouds will actually be in the same plane, but they will be 120 degrees away from each other. When we go to four electron pairs, that's what's called the tetrahedral geometry, where the electron clouds adopt a geometry where, if you looked at the end of the electron clouds where the atom would normally be, those are the points on a tetrahedron. And so uh, 
And that's kind of where the tetrahedral structure comes from. The three lone pair uh, is called trigonal planar because it's trigonal, it's planar, and then we have linear. When we go to five clouds of electron density around, a, around an atom, and we should immediately say this, these, this type of a structure is for an expanded octet. So there's going to be one instance where carbon may form a trigonal by pyramidal geometry having five lobes of electron density around it, but it will still only have four bonds. For the most part, we see trigonal by pyramidal geometries in atoms that have expanded octets like phosphorus and sulfur. When we go to six, that's called octahedral, and the bond angles you can see for octahedral are 90 degrees. There are 90 degree bond angles in the trigonal bipyramidal, and then there are 120 degree bond angles for what in essence is the trigonal planar part, which would be these red balloons, and then a linear part put, put together there that is the, um, the linear part. <coughs> so there's two distinctive positions in a trigonal bipyramidal geometry. So once we determine the total number of bonding and non-bonding pairs around the central atom, we're going to fit those into these one of these five shapes. And so my guidelines for writing Vesper structures start with the correct Lewis dot structure and then you show all the electron pairs, the bonding and the non-bonding pairs that are around the central atom. You count up those total number of electron pairs with the caveat that we treat a double or a triple bond as a single electron pair. And it will become apparent at the end of the lecture why we do that. If you um, don't know that already, there is a reason why we do that. And then you use the table that I showed you earlier to pick, predict the basic geometry of whether it's linear, trigonal planar, tetrahedral, etc. And also then, if we want the exact bond angles, then we're going to need to look at whether or not there's lone pair, lone pair repulsions. And those may squeeze bonds together and cause the bond angles to be a little bit compressed from what they were in that previous chart. So these are my guidelines. And really, we have to remember that we treat double and triple bonds as if they were a single electron pair. So here's some simple examples. CH4, if I was to draw the Lewis dot structure for CH4, I would have four hydrogens attached to the carbon. I would then say that it's got four um, bonding pairs around it, which would then make it have a tetrahedral structure. And having a tetrahedral structure, then it would have a 109 and a half bond angle between the carbon-hydrogen bonds. If you look at ammonia, NH3, ammonia has three bonding pairs to the hydrogen and one lone pair. That gives it four pairs of electrons total, and so it would also make it then tetrahedral. Only in this case, one of the positions would be occupied by this lone pair of electrons. And then for water, one of the things I love to do with water is, in general chemistry, I'll write the structure of water like this, and then ask somebody what the bond angle is between the two OH bonds, and I'll always trick somebody into thinking that it's 180 degrees. You start with the Lewis dot structure, we take this to molecular geometry, and then you calculate the bond um, angles, because if I put this structure up, somebody might be tricked into thinking it's 180 degrees. If I put up a Lewis dot structure that looks like this, I can trick people into thinking it's 90, when in fact it's not any of those. If you look at water, what do we have? We've got four pairs of electrons, two bonding, two non-bonding, and so this would fit into the core of a tetrahedral structure, only in this case, we've got two lone pairs um, in that tetrahedron. Now, water and ammonia show examples of, if I want to know about the exact bond, um, exact bonding, 
angles, what I have to do is look at the at the lone pair, lone pair repulsion or lone pair bonding pair repulsion. Basically in carbon, the electrons, the two electrons that are held in the CH bond are relatively constrained. And what I mean by that is there may be a cloud of electron density, but there's two nuclei at the either end. So it keeps these um, electrons under control or in a small area. When you have a lone pair, you don't have that atom at the end. And so these lone pairs can actually become quite large. And the larger the cloud, the more repulsion the clouds are going to undergo. So with ammonia, you would start with a 109 and a half degree bond angle, but because this lone pair, it takes up so much space, it's going to have a repulsion then with the electrons that are in the bonding pair here. And so it's going to kind of squeeze these bonds together since these are smaller clouds than the large sort of out of control or large area for the lone pair. And when you get to water, you've got a, a really good repulsion of these two lone pairs against each other. And so that causes them to sort of get away from each other. And the result then is that they squeeze the oxygen-hydrogen bonds together. And so you get, instead of 109.5, you get 104.5. And, and if you remember that from general chemistry, um, that's the reason why we have some differences in the ideal bond angles is because of the lone pair, lone pair repulsion or a lone pair bonding pair repulsion. So this is just another example of that kind of showing the large, they're trying to show here, um, the large clouds that a, a lone pair would, would have. So if I, if I gave you a problem, let's say that I gave you this molecule, which I've used in the last couple of lectures, and I asked you to identify what the geometry around that carbon atom is, could you do that? So you can stop the tape, figure out what its geometry is, what the bond angles are, you figure it out? Well, I'm looking here and I see that there are three electron pairs around that oxygen. I'm treating the double bond as if it was a single electron pair, so I see three electron pairs. That means that I'm looking at a trigonal planar geometry. So I'm looking at the carbon in the same plane, this carbon hydrogen and oxygens all in the same plane of the board in this case or of the screen. So this would be a trigonal planar and the bond angles here would be 120 degrees all the way around. What would be another good example? If I had SF6, then my Lewis dot structure for F SF6 for sulfur would have six fluorines attached to the sulfur. That means that this would have six electron pairs. That would be an octahedral geometry. And that octahedral geometry would sort of would look like this. It would be basically fluorines on what what's similar to an XYZ coordinate plane. Okay, so that's the first step in drawing the structure is getting a good Lewis dot structure and then calculate and then adding up the total number of bonding and non-bonding pairs where the uh, double and triple bonds count as a single uh, bonding or as a single pair and then we fit them into those geometries. Now for carbon before we're going to talk about sort of the the nitty-gritty details of how we form the geometry around carbon and in particular how we form our bonds. And so there's a number of ways to look at the formation of chemical bonds. The simplest is simply to say, okay, I've got my H dot and my H dot 
and take a Lewis dot structure and say, well, I'm just going to pair these two up to form the chemical to form the single bond. That's the simplest approach. What's really going on when I form a hydrogen atom? Well, we could take a little bit more complicated approach and say, well, I have electrons that are surrounding a positively charged nucleus, and when I bring the nuclei with their electrons together, at some distance, the optimum distance, the bond distance, I'm going to have both of the electrons being simultaneously attracted to the two positive nuclei. And the electrostatic force that's going to attract those electrons are in essence going to hold these two nuclei together. So I've got that um, electrostatic or coulombic attraction between the negatively charged electrons, except in this case, they're going to be e they're going to be attracted to both nuclei, and that's going to hold the two nuclei together in a chemical bond. If I push the nuclei too close together, the positive charges there will repel each other. So there's an optimum bond length where the nuclei aren't repelling each other, and where the electrons are close enough to both nuclei to form that chemical bond. But this is really a simplistic view of a chemical bond. If I really want to look at a lot of detail, what I need to remember is that electrons can be treated as either particles or waves. And so an electron moves around the nucleus as a wave. And so if you remember back to general chemistry, there were people like de Broglie, and they talked about the wave-like characteristics of electrons in addition to their particle-like properties. And so another way of looking at the formation of a, of a bond is to look at the wave nature of the electrons and bring two waves together. So for instance, if I bring two hydrogen atoms, I know the mathematical description of the electrons around that hydrogen. That's what's called the wave function, psi. And so that wave, if I have two wave functions for that hydrogen, I can bring them together those two waves will overlap and I will get a single bond. Th what I mean by that is if you think about in sort of physics terms, if I had these two waves where they both have the same amplitude, those two waves are going to add together so the resulting wave would be bigger than the original one. And so this is a three-dimensional sort of approach, but same thing. If I bring two atoms together, their wave or their wave functions can basically combine together to form now a new description of how those electrons move around the nuclei, which then is the chemical bond. Well, this wave function is the mathematical description of how the electron moves around the hydrogen atom. And if you remember the shape of an S orbital, S actually stands for spherical, and so all the S orbitals are spherical in shape. Well, where did that shape come from? If you take the wave function and you square it, you basically get the probability of finding the electron in any given three-dimensional space. And so this spherical shape of what we call the orbitals, the s orbital, is simply that wave function squared. And then we take and we plot where we're 95% confident of finding that electron around that nucleus at any one time. And that's what gives us the spherical shape. So the orbitals come from the square of that wave function of that wave-like property of the electrons. And if we go back to general chemistry, we remember that there are s orbitals, which are spherical. There are different s orbitals. There's a 1s orbital, and a 2s orbital, and a 3s orbital. The numbers 1, 2, and 3 are our principal quantum numbers, sometimes called shell numbers. But the principal quantum number tells you how far away the, nuclei, or the electrons are from the nucleus. So as you go from principal quantum number one to principal quantum number two, 
the electrons are getting farther away from the nucleus, which means the spherical orbital is getting bigger and bigger. So we have s spherical shaped orbitals, and of course these principal quantum numbers correspond to what on the periodic table. Those are really our row numbers on the periodic table. And for carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen, we also have the p orbitals in play, and the p orbitals are, base, are basically dumbbell-shaped orbitals that have two lobes. They have a nodal plane in between them. A node or a nodal plane in orbital terms is the place where the probability of finding the electrons is zero. So how the electrons move from this lobe to this lobe without ever stopping here isn't something I'm going to get into, but it has two lobes where 50% of the time we're likely to find the electrons in each of the two lobes. So p orbitals, there are three equal, three p orbitals of equal energy, what are called degenerate orbitals. And those are oriented along the three dimensions um, in space. And so we have what's called the px orbital, the py orbital, and the pz orbital. And those three are perpendicular to each other. And so what we're going to start with is looking at s and p orbitals. And in order to form a chemical bond, we're going to overlap these orbitals, which is in essence mathematically combining those two wave functions together to get a new description of how the electrons move in the chemical bond. So we're going to overlap these orbitals as if we're just basically overlapping shapes, but it's a tad bit more complicated than that. And we're not going to get into those kinds of details. So when you have a carbon atom then, if you were to draw out the electronic configuration for a carbon atom, we would start with 1s, 2s, and then the three 2ps. Carbon has six electrons, and so we would put one electron in the 1s, and then what do we do next? We put a second electron in the 1s, we then put the third electron in the 2s, we then pair it up in the 2s orbital, and then I'm going to put the I've got four. I'm going to put the fifth electron in one of the two p's. Where does the sixth electron go? It goes in this orbital. And so if you have degenerate orbitals, you have to give each orbital one electron before you can start pairing them up. So here would be the, the way that the six electrons are placed around into the carbon atom. And so, you know, in general chemistry, you wrote electronic configurations first semester, 1s1, 1s2, 2s1, 2s2, 2p1, etc., on up the line. And so this is where we're going to start. Now, of these electrons, which ones are the valence electrons? If you said the 2s and the 2p orbitals or, or electrons or the valence electrons, you're right, because those are the ones that are farthest away from the nucleus, and those are the ones that we're going to use to form our covalent bonds, to share with other atoms, and now we're going to talk about overlapping those orbitals with electrons to form now the covalent bonds. So for carbon, I'm going to look at the 2s and the 2p orbitals. Okay, and so I'm going to overlap those orbitals. For hydrogen, what I'm doing is I'm overlapping the 1s orbital, which had one electron, with another 1s orbital of hydrogen. I'm overlapping those two orbitals then to give me the hydrogen-hydrogen the hydrogen single bond. So when we talk about the bonding of carbon, it's going to involve hybridization. And this is sometimes a topic that in general chemistry, um, depending on who you had, you may not have talked a lot about hybridization or you may have talked quite a bit about it. When I teach general chemistry, uh, 
I talk quite a bit about it because I know I'm going to start with it in organic. <coughs> and as I step through here, hybridization for carbon, here's a key observation for methane. For, so methane is hydrogen, four hydrogens attached to a carbon. The Vesper theory would tell us that the carbon is tetrahedral. And so you can kind of see that tetrahedral representation in this ball in this um, ball and stick model. When people looked at methane, what they found was that all four of the CH bonds were identically the same, that they were equivalent. And so if we begin to think about how I'm going to overlap orbitals to form methane, here's what I have to think about. I'm going to start with that ground state electronic configuration of carbon and I'm going to go ahead and just eliminate the 1s orbitals and 1s electrons because they are not the valence electrons. Now if I looked at the ground state electronic configuration for carbon I've got two electrons in the 2s orbital one in the each of the two p's and then I got an empty p. Now you might be tempted to say Shouldn't that mean that the carbon Lewis dot structure would look like this? Because if you go through and you look at the electronic configurations of the atoms and then write their individual Lewis dot structures, usually these electrons in their orbitals match up with when you got a lone when you have a lone pair, you've got a pair of electrons in an orbital. So shouldn't carbon's electronic configuration look like this? Well, it doesn't, right? When we draw the electronic configuration for carbon, we draw it where we have four unpaired electrons. So here's what happens. In methane, in that carbon's ground state electronic configuration, if this was my Lewis dot structure, and I'm thinking about overlapping orbitals, which means that I'm going to take this carbon and I'm going to overlap the 2p orbital with the 1s orbital of hydrogen to form one CH bond. And then do that again, add the hydrogen, add its electron to this orbital to form now two covalent bonds. I'm stuck in the ground state electronic configuration. I could at best only form CH2 and then I'd have a lone pair. Okay, because this p orbital is empty and this one has a pair of electrons and so I can't you know put a third electron into this 2s. So when you try and take the approach of overlapping orbitals the first thing with carbon you find is that this ground state electronic configuration of carbon doesn't work. Number one I can't form four bonds to the carbon which is methane CH4. So then people said, okay, well maybe what happens is, is that one of these electrons in the 2s orbital gets promoted up to the empty p orbital of the, of the configuration. That's going to require energy and I'm going to go into an excited state. And so that gets me around then having only two unpaired electrons to bond with. And it, also, it now gives me four unpaired electrons, which looks more like the Lewis dot structure of carbon, so that now I could bring in my four hydrogens and overlap those orbitals. And so now I can form CH4. So, okay, problem number one is solved. I got CH4 instead of CH2. But then we have to think about the CH individual bonds. If I'm going to overlap orbitals, so I'm going to take the 2s orbital and I'm going to overlap it with the 1s orbital of hydrogen, I'm overlapping two spherical orbitals. If I'm going to take a 2p orbital and overlap it with a 1s orbital, I'm going to be overlapping a spherical orbital with a dumbbell shaped orbital and so the problem with this approach is that if I overlap a 1s orbital of hydrogen with a 2s orbital here, 
I'm going to have one carbon hydrogen bond that's a little bit different than the other three because overlapping two spheres is going to give me a slightly different bond than overlapping a sphere and a dumbbell. And so while this excited state takes care of the CH4 issue, it would predict that we would have three CH bonds that are equivalent but a different fourth one. And as I said earlier, one of the things that was known about methane is it is has four identical CH bonds. So this excited state only solves half the problem. So then here is what people came up with. They said, you know what, since those four bonds were identical, it must be that the 1s orbital of hydrogen overlaps with four equivalent bonds or four equivalent orbitals of carbon. How do I get that? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to mix the s and the 3p orbitals and I'm going to mix one, two, three, orb three, four orbitals together. So that means I'm going to get four equivalent orbitals, which we call sp3 orbitals because they're made up of 1s and 3p's. Okay, this isn't very creative. But I'm going to mix four orbitals together to get four hybrid orbitals. And then I'm going to place each one of those electrons into those four orbitals. And so what happens is, is that if you think about taking the spherical 2s and overlapping it with the three dumbbell shaped p orbitals, what I end up with is four sp3 hybrid orbitals where, remember in the p orbital, 50% of the electron density was in each lobe. And so when I mix these orbitals together, I actually get a larger lobe on one side and then a smaller lobe on the other. And so the four sp3 hybrid orbitals, each one has a big lobe and a little lobe. And nine times out of ten, we forget about this little lobe, but there are going to be times when we bring it back into play. So we get an a unsymmetrical um, dumbbell shape. Okay. Now you may say, well, why would the molecule hybridize, or why would these orbitals hybridize? Well, if we think about overlapping bonds, we're going to overlap a sphere and then one of these two lobes because we can't overlap both of them. If I overlap the sphere and one of those lobes, if I'm only overlapping 50% of the electron density with the sphere, it would be better in a stronger bond if I could somehow have this lobe be bigger than 50%. And so hybridization occurs to make then a larger lobe which is now going to overlap with another orbital and form a stronger bond because I'm going to have more electron density in that lobe than I would have just in a normal p orbital. So then the question is, well, what's a carbon with four sp3 hybrid orbitals around it look like? Then we go back and we think about the Vesper theory. I'm in essence going to have four clouds of electron density around that carbon atom. And so what's its geometry? Four electron clouds, tetrahedral. And so when we look at the actual structure of methane, I have, and I'm missing my little tiny lobes here, but I'll throw them in. We have the sp3 hybrid orbitals, four of those around carbon, four electron clouds adopting a tetrahedral structure and then for each of the CH bonds I go ahead and overlap the 1s orbital to the sp3 hybrid orbital of carbon and so that's going to go ahead and that's going to make my single bond. So I get four of those single bonds which gives me then a tetrahedral structure that we see for methane. Okay. So we hybridize the central atom's orbitals, and then we use those, those hybrid orbitals to now overlap with other orbitals to form the single bonds. And again, if I'm overlapping orbitals, I'm combining the mathematical wave functions together. Okay, but we're just going to think about overlapping them as if they were shapes. Okay. All right, so 
here's methane, and the hybrid orbital theory now makes every single one of these CH bonds identical. And so now we've got the issue, now we've got the idea of hybrid bonds now explain the physical structure of methane. Four bonds and a tetrahedral geometry. Now, here's an example of the sp3, and you can see the little tiny lobes in there. And then there's the tetrahedral structure of methane. So, is that the only hybridization that you can do with s and p orbitals? And the answer is no. I don't. I don't have to mix all three of the p orbitals with the uh, s. I could mix two of the three. Well, if I think about what's going to happen here, if I mix an s and two p orbitals, I'm going to now end up with three hybrid orbitals and those three hybrid orbitals if I said well if you have three electron clouds what geometry are they going to adopt according to Vesper theory you would say trigonal planar so around the carbon atom I'm going to have three hybrid orbitals that have a trigonal planar geometry and then I have one unhybridized p orbital that's just going to be perpendicular to those and so this is just your run-of-the-mill p orbital so this geometry is going to then get is then leads to what we call an sp2 hybridized carbon and so an sp2 hybridized carbon then if we bring two two if we bring two sp2 hybridized carbons together then I'm going to form a molecule and I'll form a car carbon double bond so here's what I'm going to do I'm going to draw my Lewis dot structure for the two CH2 fra two fragments that I'm going to go ahead and bring together to form the carbon carbon double bond so in Lewis dot structure terms what would I do I would have overlapped these two unpaired electrons to form the CC single bond. I would have overlapped these two unpaired electrons to form that single bond, those two unpaired electrons to form that single bond, those two electrons, and these two electrons to form my five, or my five single bonds. In the orbital picture, what does that mean? That means over here, I took one of the sp2 hybrid orbitals and I overlapped it with the 1s of hydrogen. I did the same thing here, and I did the same thing over here. So these are sp2 to s overlaps. In the To form the carbon-carbon bond, I overlapped two sp2s, so I'm going to form in the carbon-carbon bond an sp2-sp2 single bond by overlapping the two sp2 hybrid orbitals. Now, what I should have done is to come back up here and say, all right, after I formed my sp2 hybridized carbon, I then go back and figure out how many electrons I have to place into those orbitals. And so what I would end up with is one unpaired electron in each of the hybrid orbitals, and then one unpaired electron in the p orbital, which spends 50% of its time in you know each lobe of the p orbital so it looks like this carbon might be sort of trigonal bipyramidal the orbitals are trigonal bipyramidal but this carbon only has four unpaired electrons around it which means it's only going to share eight so how did i form these bonds i took the one electron in the sp2 and overlapped it with the electron in the 1s orbital of hydrogen so this structure then is the equivalent of this Lewis dot structure. But then I've got two unpaired two more unpaired electrons that I need to pair up to form the double bond. Well that's this p orbital and this unhybridized p orbital that now have each that each have one electron 
And so here's what I have to think about. I have to think about how to overlap these different orbitals. Well, the way that we've been forming the way we've been forming bonds now by directly overlapping the 1s and the sp3 and now the sp2 hybrid orbitals is what I would call a head to head overlap. When you overlap two orbitals head to head, that's what's called forming a sigma bond. And so sigma bonding is when you head you overlap orbitals head to head. Now, a sphere doesn't have any direction, so it automatically forms a sigma bond because there's really no direction in a sphere. But these hybrid orbitals have a direction with the big lobe and then our little lobes, and we want to overlap the larger lobe, and so there is a direction to them. I'm going to form, if I take this Lewis dot structure, my next thing would be to pair this up to form the carbon-carbon double bond. How does that happen in the orbital picture? In the orbital picture, what's going to happen is I'm going to overlap these two unhybridized p orbitals side to side or sideways to form now the double bond. And so when we have the sideways overlap, that's what's called pi bonding. And so when you sideways overlap orbitals, that's pi bonding. When you head to head over or overlap orbitals, that's called sigma bonding. And the only orbitals you can overlap uh, sideways are p orbitals. And so that means that the pi bonds come from the p orbitals sideways overlapping. And so in the end, I end up with the structure of this CH2 double bonded to CH2 has now all these sigma bonds from the direct head to head overlap and then it has one pi bond from the sideways overlap of the two p orbitals and people often ask they what is the pi bond the pi bond is going to be both of these lobes overlapping and since the p orbitals have a nodal plane here the pi bond also has a nodal plane. And so there's going to be sort of a hot dog shaped um, electron density, a uh, uh, circle of electron density up here, and then there'll be an area of electron density below that nodal plane. And that, those two lobes together make up one pi bond. So if I keep doing this, I'm going to overlap. Here's my pi bond now. Both lobes make up the pi bond. And then all these shaded bonds in this structure, these are all the sigma bonds, and then that is my pi bond. So if I looked at the picture, here's a color picture of it. All of the green orbitals are S to SP2 hybrid orbital overlaps. The yellow in the center is an SP2, SP2. And then the red hot dog shaped orbitals, those are the two lobes of the pi bond. And then this is just another view that the computer generates, and it turns out that the actual hot dog shapes of the pi bonds isn't quite correct. They're more like half mushroom shaped. But the idea is that if I mix an S and two P's, that's going to lead me to be able to form three sigma bonds, and then the unhybridized P orbital is going to be used to form a pi bond. So three single bonds and then the multiple bond comes from overlapping the p orbitals. Okay, hopefully you're still with me. And here's just another view of showing the sigma and the pi bonds. And then here's the sort of flat structure of ethylene of CH2CH2. Now just take a moment here and sort of think about that structure and then your pi bonds would be above and below the plane here. These are all your sigma bonds. The core of the sigma bonds here could be described as being 
trigonal planar. And why does it have that geometry? Because those were the three hybrid orbitals that were used to form the sigma bonds. So hybrid orbitals are always used to form the sigma bonds. And that sets the core trigonal planar geometry. Remember in Vesper theory we said count the number of bonding electrons and then you treat a double bond as if it was a single electron pair. Well, you can kind of begin to see that the reason for that is because the core geometry around a central atom is determined by its hybridization. And more specifically, by the number of hybrid orbitals. So if you have four hybrid orbitals, that corresponded to an sp3 hybridized geometry or hybridization, and that will then be tetrahedral, because that's how you place four lobes of electron density around the structure. When we have three hybrid orbitals around a central atom, that means we have sp2 hybridization, and so that's going to give us trigonal planar geometry. Why don't I worry about the pi bond? Because the pi bond is like above and below the trigonal planar bonds. Pi bonds don't contribute to the geometry. As a matter of fact, we'll see that we could break a pi bond and this molecule will still stick together. So when I said take double and triple bonds and just treat them as a single bond, the reason we're doing that is because the pi bonds, the double and the triple bonds, are not what dictates the geometry. What dictates the geometry are the sigma bonds and what come and the sigma bonds come from where? They come from the hybrid orbitals. So we're going to make a chart that correlates Vesper theory and hybridization. Okay. So ethylene, CH2, double bonded to CH2, all those atoms are in the same plane. It's flat. And it's that flat because each of the carbons is sp2 hybridized. Okay. So the third type of hybridization, sp hybridization. So when we think about sp hybridization, this is the third possibility. I'll only mix 1s and 1p, and if I do that, how many hybrid orbitals am I going to get? I'm going to get two hybrid orbitals. What geometry are those two hybrid orbitals going to take on from Vesper theory? A linear geometry. So here around my carbon atom that's sp hybridized, I'm going to have two hybrid orbitals. What's going to happen to the other two unhybridized p's? They're just going to be normal p orbitals. One will be maybe oriented along py and then pz. Once I set up my hybrid orbitals, now I'm going to go ahead and put the electrons in. And so each one of these orbitals is going to have one unpaired electron. So I'm going to have each of the hybrid orbitals gets one electron and then each of the unhybridized orbitals gets one electron. But remember, 50% of the time, that electron will be found in this lobe, and then the other 50% in the bottom lobe, 50% in this lobe that's pointing away from you, and the one that's pointing towards you. So now if I want to form a carbon-carbon triple bond, I'd start with a CH, and bond it to another CH group. I'd form, I'd share the first pair of electrons. That's the equivalent of doing what? That's the equivalent of head-to-head -head overlap of the two sp hybrid orbitals for carbon. So I'm going to get an sp-sp sigma bond. I form the CH bonds by overlapping the other sp hybrid orbital with the 1s of hydrogen. And so I get two sps sigma bonds. Remember the sigma bonds 
the head-to-head -head overlap that you get with the hybrid orbitals is what gives you the single bonds. So then over here on the other side, I've got an S to SP sigma bond. And so now here's my core structure. Then what am I going to do? I'm going to overlap two p orbitals that have one electron each sideways to form one pi bond. That would be the equivalent of doing this. And then the other p orbitals that are, in this case, they're perpendicular to the screen, they're going to overlap sideways to form the second pi bond, which would be the equivalent of doing this. So in an sp hybridized carbon, I only have two sigma bonds. And what's the geometry around this carbon then? If you said linear, you're right. This is a linear geometry. And so therefore, the linear geometry comes from the fact that I've got an sp hybridized atom with two hybrid orbitals that are used to form the sigma bonds. The pi bonds, if I go to the next slide, the pi bonds that are formed are not part, they don't dictate the geometry. They're above and below the plane that holds the sigma bond. And so now I've got two pi bonds, and in this case three sigma bonds. Here's the structure. Here's one pi bond. There's the second pi bond. There's the sp sp sigma bond in yellow and the SPS sigma bond in green. Okay. And so for carbon then you have three possible hybridization states. You've got SP3, SP2, and SP. Here's another picture showing the more hot dog shape of the pi bonds. So for carbon then, we have sp3 hybridization, we've got sp2 hybridization, and we've got sp hybridization possible. Okay, so let's just make a little quick chart here. So this is the hybridization. How many hybrid orbitals do I have in each one of those hybridizations? For the sp3, I've got four hybrid orbitals. For sp2, I've got three hybrid orbitals. And for sp, I've got two hybrid orbitals. Okay, great. What's the geometry around that atom? tetrahedral, trigonal planar, and linear. So you can see there's a correlation between the hybridization, the number of hybrid orbitals, and the geometry. And I'm leaving one important thing out here. And what I would stick in here is I would stick in the number four, the number three and the number two again. And in this column, I would say that what's also in this chart is that the number of hybrid orbitals also then correlates to the number of sig sigma or single bonds because it's the hybrid orbitals are the only orbitals that can form the single bonds. The pi bonds are formed from the sideways overlap of the um, unhybridized piece. Okay. So carbon then, the hybridization of carbon is what gives it its geometry for a central atom. Now, what happens when we go to atoms, other atoms like oxygen or nitrogen, what kind of, what happens there, particularly when
I've got atoms that now have lone pairs. What are their geometries? What hybridizations do they form? Well, when it's oxygen and nitrogen, they have, in essence, similar electronic configurations to that of carbon. Right? And so when I look at the oxygen, just as an example, oxygen, if I just look at the valence electrons, how many valence electrons does oxygen have? Six, right? So I'm going to put one, two, three, four, five, six valence electrons into oxygen. But one of the things that we have to remember is that when I form, when I do my hybridizations, I am just hybridizing the orbitals. I'm only hybridizing the orbitals. So if I wanted to form an sp3 hybridized oxygen, I'm going to mix the s and the three p's. And what am I going to get? I'm going to get an oxygen with one, two, three, four sp3 hybrid orbitals. Same thing's true for nitrogen. Nitrogen is going to have the 2s and the 2p, only in this case it's got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So if I wanted an sp3 hybridized nitrogen, what's it going to look like? Well, I'm going to mix the 3p's and the 1s, so I'm going to get four hybrid orbitals around that nitrogen. But what's going to be different? Well, I hybridize orbitals, and then I put the electrons into the orbitals. So for oxygen, it had an sp3 hybridized oxygen is exactly the same as looks exactly the same as an sp3 hybridized carbon. but the carbon had one unpaired electron each in each orbital, how many electrons are going to go into the oxygen orbitals? Six. And so I'm going to have two lone pairs and one unpaired in two orbitals. Where are the sigma bonds going to come from in oxygen? Well, you only form the sigma bonds by overlapping hybrid orbitals with one electron, with one unpaired electron. Because when I overlap the hybrid orbitals, or if I overlap a hybrid orbital and a 1s orbital of hydrogen, I'm, in, I'm sharing electrons, so each of those orbitals is going to bring one electron. I don't overlap the orbitals that the lone pairs are sitting in. So in this case, I take my sp3 hybridized oxygen, and I would be able to form two sigma bonds, two single bonds. And then what's that oxygen going to have? Two single bonds and two lone pairs. What's its geometry? Its core geometry is tetrahedral. The bonds may squish a little bit, but it's still tetrahedral. How about nitrogen? How many electrons are going to be in the four sp3 hybrid orbitals of nitrogen? One pair and three unpaired. And so the idea here is that if I know what the sp3, sp2, and sp hybridized geometries around atoms are, it doesn't matter what the atom is. I can draw that hybridization for that atom and then put the appropriate number of electrons around that. Okay, so for instance, 
So if I had water, for instance, and I'll just do an example or two, and then this is actually sort of where we're going to go on Wednesdays in Wednesday's lecture. But if I said, here's a Lewis dot structure for water, can you sketch out the orbital pictures of how water is forming its sigma bonds in this case? And so what I would do is I would say this. What is the hybridization of that oxygen? And if you're saying, well, I don't know, go back to that chart, which is somewhere way back here, where I correlated hybridization to the number of hybrid orbitals which was correlated to the number of single bonds, which was correlated to the Vesper geometry. So if I have to, I can answer this question a number of ways. I can say, okay, what's the Vesper geometry around this oxygen? If you said tetrahedral, great. If I asked you what, how many sigma bonds or how many single bonds are there to this oxygen, you would say two. The problem here is that for the not, that number of hybrid orbitals rule or the number of sigma bonds only works for carbon. And so for the non-carbon atoms, we have to make the assumption that the lone pairs are also going to go into hybrid orbitals. So instead of saying that it has, you know, two sigma bonds, I have to look at, to calculate the hybridization of a non-carbon atom, I have to count the number of, sig of sigma bonds and add to that the number of lone pairs because what's going to happen in a non-carbon non atom is that the lone pairs are also going to go into hybridized orbitals. But if you don't like this formula, then go back to the Vesper geometry. What's the Vesper geometry around this oxygen? Tetrahedral. What hybridization corresponds to tetrahedral? SP3. So what's an sp3 oxygen look like? It looks like that. Now I put in two lone pairs and two unpaired electrons. The unpaired electrons are going to be used to do what? To form the sigma bonds. What are sigma bonds? Head-to-head -head overlap. And so I'm going to overlap the hydrogen atoms to the sig to the sp3 hybrid orbitals like that and so there's an orbital picture of water it's tetrahedral in geometry how about an orbital picture for a co double bond what would that look like well let me ask you the question of what is the hybridization of carbon what is the hybridization of that oxygen going to be? What's the hybridization of carbon? It's got one, two, three sigma bonds. And so it's going to be sp2. What's the hybridization of this oxygen going to be? Well, I can answer that with the geometry. It's going to be trigonal planar because these two lone pairs are going to be planar to the bonding pair over here. Or I can use this formula and say it's the number of sigma bonds, which is 1, plus the number of lone pairs, which is 2, which means it's going to have three hybrid orbitals, which makes its geometry sp2. So now if I want to draw that picture, I'm going to draw an sp2 hybridized carbon. So I like to shade in my hybrid orbitals and then leave my unhybridized p orbitals unshaded. So here is an sp2 
to hybridize carbon. Here is an sp2 hybridized oxygen. In the Lewis dot structure here, I would have one electron in each of those three hybrid orbitals for carbon and then one electron in the p orbital. For the oxygen, I'm going to have one unpaired electron in the s and the p, and then I'm going to have two lone pairs in those hybrid orbitals. So, probably need another rule here that you never put lone pairs into p orbitals. Lone pairs are always going to go into the hybrid orbitals. So the unhybridized orbitals are always going to contain a single unpaired electron. So there's my structure for that sp2 hybridized oxygen. Now I put my hydrogens in, right? And so I've got the 1s orbital of, oxygen, of hydrogen overlapping with the sp2 orbitals of carbon. So there's my two CH single bonds, or sigma bonds. I'm going to overlap the sp2 orbitals of carbon and oxygen to form that sigma bond. And now what's left? What's left is to overlap the p orbitals sideways to form the pi bond. And so my structure of this carbonyl is to have two CH sigma bonds, a CO sigma bond, and then a CO pi bond. And the oxygen then has the two lone pairs lying in the trigonal planar hybridized orbitals. So that's how we're going to step through. The first thing you need to do is identify the geometry around the atom, then sketch out that hybridized sort of picture of that atom, and it doesn't. the hybridized picture doesn't matter. It's always the same for oxygen, nitrogen. SP3 hybridized oxygen is always the same as an sp3 hybridized carbon, as an sp3 hybridized nitrogen. What's different is the number of pairs, a, a number of lone pairs and unpaired electrons that go around that atom. And that's going to differ whether you're an oxygen, a nitrogen, or a carbon. Right. So if you're an overly ambitious student, Why don't you try, try this? Can you sketch sort of the picture, the orbital picture for this molecule, CH3NH2? Could you sketch the orbital picture for HCN? Could you look at the orbital picture for, mm, let's say, hydrogen double bonded to carbon, or carbon carbon double bond? And then how about what would the orbital sort of overlap picture be for that molecule? Right. And so could you try can you try those? You're gonna have to identify the hybridization of the carbon, the hybridization of the nitrogen, sketch out those hybridization pictures, and then start overlapping the orbitals to form the sigma bonds. And remember that the lone pairs always go in the hybrid orbitals and that the p orbitals only contain one electron so that way they can sideways overlap.
And another molecule that I love to give at this point is carbon dioxide, where I've got an oxygen double bonded to a carbon, double bonded to an oxygen like that. It's a little trickier. Could you draw that structure? Okay. So what we'll do on Wednesday is we will I'll have I'll ask you if you have any questions on the hybridization, on how to hybridize and what it means. And then I'll ask you either we'll do these problems or I'll ask you, have you tried these problems and how do we approach drawing the pictures um, with the of the orbitals um, of these molecules to show the overlaps of them, in particular the CO2. And then what I'll do is then I'll expand the octet for atoms like phosphorus and sulfur. And finally end by saying or by explaining why we have the rule that group three elements or lower are the only ones that can form expanded octets. There's something special about being in a group in row three or lower. And that has to do with hybridization. And so we'll do these problems and then I'll expand the octet or ask you to expand the octets and then that'll finish up our discussion of hybridization for Wednesday. Okay. I will place an online quiz for this lecture. It may not go up until Saturday, sometime Saturday afternoon. I will send out an email telling you when it's available. Um, it will be available up until your class time on Wednesday. Our in-class quiz on Wednesday will be over what we talked about today in lecture, which was, uh, what was it? The Lewis acid base, the electrophile nucleophiles. And so, and, and also the, I, the homework problems that we've, that I, that I put online would be excellent problems to go over so that, because the quiz, the quiz problems may look something like that, or the quiz problem may look like that. Okay, if you have any questions, doesn't make sense, email me or come see me before Wednesday.